In both the swing to and swing through gate patterns, there are two major requirements. Number one is that they have sufficient bilateral upper extremity strength as described in the previous video. So if you want more information on that, go back and see that, where we also cover other common gate patterns with bilateral assisted devices. The other requirement is that they have a non-restricted weight-bearing status, so they're full weight-bearing on both lower extremities in terms of having no orthopedic injuries. Now the major patient population that's going to be utilizing these gait patterns is going to be those in the neurological setting. So two indications here are those with paralyzed lower extremities, for example, those with a spinal cord injury, and also those with lower extremities and braces like KAFOs or HKAFOs. So now let's take a look at the swing two pattern. So the first step is advancing both assistive devices at the same time. So first is going to be the left and right axillary crutches. Then, after you advance the assistive devices, you're going to advance both legs at the same time. So basically both crutches, both legs, both crutches, both legs, and repeat. And this one is termed the swing two pattern because you'll notice that the legs advance just to the level of the crutches or the assistive devices. So that is a swing two pattern. Now, one important note that applies to both the swing two and swing through gait patterns. Remember I said that a common patient that would use these would be those with a spinal cord injury. So if somebody has a spinal cord injury, depending on how high it is, they're not going to have a lot of their anterior musculature that helps to advance the legs. For example, the hip flexors and even the core. So a huge amount of the movement of the legs is actually going to be generated by momentum shift. So for example, in the neurological setting at one point, we were gait training a patient with a C7 spinal cord injury. So he had the vast majority of his upper extremity strength, very strong arms and shoulder girdle muscles. But he had no hip flexors. He had no core activation. And so the way he was able to advance his legs was purely using momentum shift. So as I'm doing this here in the video, I make it look pretty easy. That's because I have those muscles activating. In patients with a spinal cord injury, they're going to have to rely entirely on momentum shift, especially when the injury occurs above the lumbar spine. Let's now take a look at the swing through gait pattern. So this is going to have the same requirements and indications as the swing two pattern, and it's almost identical in how it works. If you notice, first, I'm advancing both of the crutches or the assisted devices at the same time, and then I'm advancing both legs at the same time. But what's the major difference here as compared to the swing two pattern? Well, notice that now my legs are advancing beyond the point of the assistive devices, or I'm swinging through the assistive devices, and that's what gives this its name. This gait pattern is more difficult than the swing two pattern, and therefore it's a progression of the swing two pattern. The patient that I mentioned a few minutes ago with the C7 spinal cord injury was only able to get to the swing two pattern, and there was also a large pause in between each swing for him to gather his balance, even with the harness on. So this one's going to be more difficult, and therefore, most likely if the patient has a cervical spinal cord injury, they're not going to be able to do this. It's most likely going to be patients who have a lower spinal cord injury, like in the lower lumbar spine, or even patients with spina bifida. They may be able to do this pattern with training. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.